Hi, I'm Joanna Barron. And I'm Leslie Gray. Welcome to the Love and Dividends podcast where women get smart about money. We'll share interviews and conversations about optimizing your finances, getting started with investing, and building wealth. Today, we're chatting with Anjali Pradhan. Anjali is an investment coach to women through her business, Dahlia Wealth. She teaches women to invest their money so that they can grow their wealth and live their best lives. She offers her services through a unique online program designed for women, which includes small group coaching. She started her career in London, England, where she worked for many of the big banks like Goldman Sachs and HSBC. Her goal is to financially empower 5,000 women in the next five years. She has a BCom from Concordia's John Molson School of Business and is a chartered financial analyst. In today's episode, Anjali tells us about a well-balanced diet of stocks and bonds, investing for tangible goals, taking care of your money and investments as a form of self-care, and making sure you wait for that bull market bust. Enjoy! Okay, we're here with Anjali Pradhan, the founder of Dahlia Wealth. How's your quarantine going, Anjali? Um, you know what? It was a rough first week, but I think there are kind of two types of people in this world and you either let something like this break you. And if that's you and you're having a hard time, there's no shame. You know, um, we all hope differently. Um, so after the first week of really struggling, I put some procedures in place, being the good Capricorn that I am, meaning I started going for long walks and a bit of exercise. And really, I gave myself a pep talk. I'm an investment coach. This is a time that people really need me. And so that gave me the drive and the motivation to, you know, not sit watching Netflix for eight hours a day. <laughs> the fact that if I was doing that, I feel I seen, be... I feel called out. <laughs> Netflix eight hours a day. No, no, no. I'm with you, Joe. I love Netflix has really been helping me out too. So I'm with you. I just signed up for Crave too. It's like so dangerous. (laughs) Whatever. Go on. Sorry. Honestly, I honestly do not have. I I wish I had more time for those things. I'm like, this is time to you know be what by myself and do my own thing. But it's not what the universe had for me and that's totally cool so I'm happy to be here and you know spread the good word about investing to women all over (laughs) yeah we need your wisdom right now especially like right now now is the time um so let's get Uh, into it so you had a big career um in investment banking you worked in the traditional banking industry um and now you are back in Montreal your hometown and you are a women's investment coach so um, can you tell us a bit about that journey and and all the pivots and why this has become your mission? Yeah, absolutely. So it definitely was a journey. Um, you know, people see me now and, you know, especially younger women look at it and they're inspired. But, you know, I've had my shares of struggles and ups and downs and doubts. So um, here's how it all went down. So, yeah, I grew up uh, in, in Montreal and uh, I went to Concordia and it studied business and finance there. But I really just, uh, you know, had itchy feet. I wanted to see the world. So I moved to London, England right after uh, my BCom, um, just with a bag and basically like a hockey bag full of my belongings and my diploma. Um, And um, I didn't know anyone there. I didn't even have like a place to live. Um, I ended up at a really smelly youth hostel for the first few days. Um, but, uh, you know, I was determined to make it work. Uh, I, I coming back with my tail between my legs was not an option. So, um, so yeah, so I ended up, you know, uh, staying in London for five years. Um, I started working on a contract and then I got a permanent role and yeah, I, I ended up working for a number of the big international banks like Goldman Sachs, um, and HSBC. And then, um, my last position uh, in London, where I was for about two and a half years, uh, was a company named PIMCO. Uh, they're a big bond fund manager. And um, I was uh, promoted to a VP level position. Um, I started off as an associate and I was promoted um, a couple of years later to, um, to, to run my own um, territory for business development. 
um, and, and that territory was actually uh, on in mainland Europe. So they transferred me to Amsterdam, where we had a, a local office. Um, and so, you know, things, I was 28 years old, I was promoted to a VP level position, all the goodies and like kind of monetary compensation was like on my doorstep, basically about to happen. And, you know, like I was about to make it basically like in kind of, you know, corporate speak. Um, uh, but things didn't go as planned. I was uh, laid off just a few short weeks after this big like promotion and uh, relocation. Um, this was uh, during the 2008 crash. So this was right after Lehman Brothers went down. So it was um, October of 2008. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so things were, um, I've seen better days, you know, I'd seen better days. It was a, a jarring uh, thing to go through. But I decided at that point, you know, I just really wanted to be uh, close to home. Um, I'd spent uh, well, five years in like abroad. And uh, it was time to, to, to be closer to friends and family. So I decided to relocate to Montreal uh, or, yeah, come back to Montreal. And uh, I knew that it might take a bit of time for me to fall back on my feet. But, you know, I had this like stellar resume. Um, at the age of 28, I'd done everything right. Um, and the system had rewarded me. Okay. Um, but I found that, you know, when I was looking for work back here in Canada, and even I applied for roles in the States and interviewed, um, I went through hundreds, uh, I applied to hundreds of jobs. Um, I attended dozens of interviews, and I came up empty handed. And um, at a certain point, I was like, you know, this is really odd. Like I was doing so well, you know, when I was in London and Amsterdam and then I, you know, the market crashes and I come back here and it's just every door is being shut in my face. And then I realized I was being shut out of the boys club. Um, and, you know, the banking industry is still very much, you know, a white boys club. Um, I am neither one of those things. <laughs> I'm a woman of color. Um, <laughs> And, you know, how, even though having like this great background and, and you know, whatever, it, it didn't matter. So I was grateful at that point that I stopped blaming myself. Okay. Cause um, I know, you know, a lot of ladies can probably relate, you know, when things don't go our way, we tend to blame ourselves, but I realized it wasn't me, it was them. So I had two choices. I could either continue kind of looking for a regular job as uh, or a real job as you know a lot of uh, people like to call it or I could uh, do my own thing and start my own business so I decided to uh, go to do the latter and to start a business coaching women to invest their money uh, that's really powerful story thank you so much for sharing that um, and for our benefit we're thrilled that that's the decision you made and so excited to have you here, which leads us perfectly into what would your advice be for young women just starting out with investing or, or young people generally, and, and particularly to those who perhaps don't feel like they have a ton of money to invest in and feel very overwhelmed by the system and the times. You've pulled yourself through 2008, the last sort of big recession we've seen. So can you sort of talk about advice for someone starting out? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I think people realize that right now is a good time to start investing, um, but they don't know how and they're scared because there's all these like headlines out there. So um, the first thing is don't look at the headlines, okay? <laughs> they really don't <laughs> matter. Uh, you know, I'm telling you, it's actually, you know, it's all my mom likes to say it's always a good time to invest. Like my mom took my, my online course to mm. like a really proud, like daughter slash uh, coach of hers. Always a good time to invest, which is true, but now is a better time than others. Uh, just because uh, the stock market prices are, uh, you know, lower than they have been in some time. So, you know, if you've been on the fence, um, this is, this is the sign you've been waiting for. Um, you know, this is the time mm. for you to, to really get a head start. Um, and, you know, even if you are just starting out and you don't have like a ton of money or you have a modest salary, you can you can still invest and not just invest and make, you know, get a bit of financial security, 
you can invest and become wealthy. I don't think anyone tells us that enough. Even at, like there's stories of librarians who on their modest librarian salary have become uber wealthy, giving to charity, helping friends and family, all that good stuff that we all want um, on their salary. So, you know, the important thing is to continue adding money over time. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you know, if you have been on the fence, this is, this is, this is a great time to, to start. So Angel, you and I often talk about, cause we've spoken together before about the magic of compound interest and time in the market, not timing the market. Um, but right now where we're in this, you know, unfortunately I did read the headlines this morning that the bank of Canada said, this is like our worst downturn ever, but that compound <laughs> interest factor would be seen to be working in reverse. So can you just break down the sort of mechanics of why it's advantageous to get in close to the bottom or when you log in and you see that you've like hemorrhaged money, um, why not to pay attention to that and why we should expect things to turn around? Right. So that's a great question. And I have a friend, a good friend. We were actually colleagues um, um, at PIMCO who sent me a great, great piece of data. Um, even if we miss out on the first month of the recovery, so recovery is like when, you know, when the market turns around, which by the way, the bottom, like no one knows when the bottom is. Okay. Like you have to be a wizard to know where the bottom is. And like, it, if anyone tells you they know, just like run, like no one knows. Experts don't know, no one knows. There's just so much <laughs> uncertainty right now um, in not just the financial system, but like the world, you know, <laughs> like, so totally. just, uh, just nobody knows. So the, 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 what we can, what we do know is, is that just missing out on the first month of the recovery, you want to know what the, the shortfall is, like what you're missing out on. They looked at all the recessions and the crashes since 1957, and they saw that even if you were a month late in getting on the wagon, you would have missed out on average 28% return. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> that is an astronomical amount considering that on average, the stock markets return about 8%. <laughs> okay. But it gets better. 2008 was like more extreme because it was a longer, um, uh, you know, upward trend, meaning an uh, equity bull market was the longest in history. If you missed out on the first month of recovery in 2008, um, you would have foregone 133% in return. So basically, like your money would have more than doubled if you had, you know, been in there since. So, I mean, let that sink in. So, you know, it just get in and don't worry about, you know, is this the bottom? Is this not? It's like, I like explaining it this way. Like the, there's a bus. It's about to come. The bus only comes like every few years. Do not leave the bus stop when the bus is about to come. Okay. When the bus <laughs> is about to come. We are at an inflection point where we're about to see, you know, an upturn at some point. It might be next month. It might be uh, in six months. It might be in a year, but it will come. Okay, the markets always, always come back. Like it's like the biggest comeback kid ever. <laughs> so little follow up. So just to break it down. So you're saying get in now when stock prices are cheap, because if you're investing in a sort of broad based diversified portfolio, which maybe we'll talk about more specifically in a minute, um, you are going to have your money in companies that will come roaring back and you just bought equity in them for cheap. You know it, girl. I uh, couldn't have said it better oh. myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh. just so that's clear. It's just, you can't say it enough because, you know, as you said, the headlines every day are so scary. Worst ever, worst downturn ever. I mean, journalists know what they're doing. This makes us terrified. Um, so you almost yeah. have to like lobotomize yourself to get yourself into the right mindset around this. Yeah, I get asked a lot uh, about, you know, what stocks I recommend or what industries I recommend. And um, what you said is absolutely right. I don't recommend any stock or industry um, ever, really, because I believe in, um, you know, a broad based 
portfolio, like you said, that has a little bit of every industry across the across the economy. Um, because the truth is, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a good way to go about um, your investing at any time. Um, but especially right now when there's like so much risk and there's like a lot of people who are, you know, tempted like, oh, what if, you know, I bet on the industries that are, I think are going to do well and others maybe won't do well. So I'll stay away from those. I mean, there are so much, investing is really about evaluating risk. Okay. That is the kind of currency, quote unquote, that we buy returns with. Okay. So it, it's all about risk. It's not about how much returns you want to make. It's about how much risk you're, you're willing to, uh, to take. And the truth is that there are risks that have come to the surface, which we were not, we're not even on the horizon or like, you know, figment of our imagination three, four months ago. I mean, who would have thought that going to the grocery store and buying food <laughs> and bringing it home would propose a, like a public health risk and, you know, a risk to your, you know, your, to, to your life, you know, <laughs> like no one. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the world is full of these sort of new risks that we hadn't even like considered and evaluated. And so there's really, you know, no point trying to like get a handle on this when you can just invest in the entire market, you know, a nice um, robust portfolio of stocks and bonds. Um, we don't talk enough about bonds because sometimes, you know, sometimes I'll say um, I'm active on, on Instagram and I'll say like, you know, stocks are cheap. And then someone will come to me and back be like, I've been listening. I bought XYZ stocks. And I'm like, no, <laughs> it's not just about right. buying stocks. You need the bonds as well to really anchor your portfolio. They're like, the bonds are like, um, they're like vegetables. Okay. Often, mm. you know, people who are let's say into, you know, fitness and weightlifting. I've been doing, you know, some weightlifting myself the past few years and I hired a nutritionist. She's been telling me to bulk up on my protein. So that's kind of like your stock. Um, but doesn't mean that you can stop eating vegetables. Um, I tried that. It didn't work. <laughs> it did not work. <laughs> so <laughs> stock and bonds, you know, you need both of them and you need to figure out what proportion works for you. And these are the type of things that like, you know, I coach my students through like what, what, percentage of stocks and bonds is best for your situation and also your psychological makeup, like how much risk can you take on psychologically without going crazy? Yeah. And Anjali, I think that's a great point. And I love your bus metaphor, just to circle back to that as a Toronto girl, shout out to the 97A Young Boulevard bus. I've waited a long time. I've missed many of buses. I've it never comes. Buses. But I just yeah. find that like <laughs> such a great metaphor. But then there's nothing sweeter than when it comes and you like get a seat. And so I, I actually frankly love that metaphor. And I love that it's sort of that chased losses when you think, okay, I've missed it. I just don't want to wait around anymore. And I like you sort of doing the, the inspiration of no, no, stay on it. It's en route. You know, it's coming. Don't leave. And yeah, I, I sort of view that as don't sell, don't tap out of the market now. Yeah, um, exactly. Don't tap out of the market. I love that. And then in, in terms of risk, I the, what you said leads perfectly into our next question, which is sort of what would you say are some smart money moves to make right now? And I think for a lot of us, uh, especially starting out, we have an idea of how much risk we're willing to tolerate. But a moment like this, and you're so right to say risk is not just with our finances, but leaving the house is now a risk. Um, I think a lot of us are learning what our risk tolerance really is. So can you, yeah, talk about what sort of the next move would be and, and the smartest way to handle this right now as we're starting to see our risk tolerances? Um, yeah, it's it's really um, about figuring out, uh, you know, your kind of needs for or your investment horizon, okay? Um, and that's kind of like what you look at. So if you're like investing for, um, you know, some sort of life goal, which is something I encourage my students to do because a lot of investment talk revolves around retirement. And um, let's face it, retirement is A, not very sexy to talk about or to think about. Um, and B, it's like a long ways off. Humans are not very good at, striving for goals that are like 20, 30 years away um, that aren't that exciting in the first place. So 
you know, I encourage my students to, to look at other goals that they might have. Like maybe they want to one day quit their job and start a business. Uh, maybe they want to, you know, um, travel the world for six months. Um, I encourage them to, to save and invest towards those. So whatever your goal is, if you're, you know, looking for towards retirement, what is that horizon and how much risk can you take on between now and then? Time is really the biggest thing when it when looking at how much risk you can take on. Um, so the longer time horizon you have before that goal becomes due or so before uh, you need that money, the more risk you can take on. All things being equal, I mean, there's lots of other variables as well. It's not just about time, but all things being equal, uh, the longer your sort of runway for your plane to take off, the, the safer it is. Like, you know, uh, you know, we've all seen sort of videos of those sort of um, you know, jets that are military jets that are landing on a tiny little uh, landing pad in the middle of the ocean. And we're all sort of holding our breath. Okay, well, you don't want to have to land on a little tiny little runway, give yourself a long, long runway. So, you know, if you're saving towards retirement, start as soon as possible. Um, you know, start saving for those goals as soon as possible, because time heals, you know, they say time heals a lot of wounds. Well, time also uh, kind of it heals a lot of wounds in your portfolio. So if, you know, if in case anything happens, like, you know, right now, uh, you know, the market has taken a dip. Um, you know, if you have a long investment horizon, it actually doesn't matter. If you're only going to retire in 20 years, um, it really doesn't, this crash is really just, you know, it seems right now, it seems like, you know, it's the end of the world. If you do already have investments and you've seen the value of this, your portfolio dip, um, but it's really just going to be a blip. Okay, um, like we get over these blips and we get over these crashes like we did 2001, um, like we did 2008. And, um, you know, you just need to be in it for the long term and things will work out. Okay, awesome. So uh, one of the things, Anjali, that you and I kind of bonded over when we met, which I guess is like a year and a half ago now in Montreal, um, was that we're both obviously financial feminists and passionate about investing, but we also are major meditators and we see our mindfulness practice as totally connected to um, to everything else we do. And uh, I know that on your social media, you talk a lot about money mindsets and personal narratives. Um, so can you say a little bit more about that? And uh, because you work with so many women, um, which types of undermining or empowering money stories do you see and how does it play into the ultimate goal of building sort of financial freedom and wealth? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of times, you know, we taught right now we're in uh, investment literacy month, uh, which I'm not making a big, big deal over because every day is investment literacy month at Dahlia Wealth, but um <laughs> You know, like the problem with investment li that I have with kind of the term investment literacy is that I feel that it it really negates this idea and ignores this idea that you're alluding to, Joanna, is that it is a, a lot about mindset. OK, it's not just about information. It's not just information that women are lacking. Um, even if you are given all the information in the world, which right now we have a lot of kind of data and tips at our fingertips, if our mindset is one such that we don't, we're not open to receiving that information um, because we're scared of money or we haven't, we've had an uncomfortable situation um, that's made us wary um, or there's shame surrounding, you know, your money relationship you're not going to have an easy time taking to that information. You're going to be scared. You're going to be feel uncomfortable. Um, and you're not going to want to really embrace wealth and, and striving towards abundance. So, um, I mean, like our money mindset starts in childhood. We're taught, uh, little girls are taught that we need to be careful with money and we need to save. We're very women. A lot of times we consider ourselves savers um, and very few of us consider ourselves investors. Um, you know, whereas men, it's it's kind of the other way around. Um, men are kind of taught that, you know, they need to go out and 
and make money and, and, you know, becoming wealthy is a totally desirable thing <laughs> to strive towards. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of cultural, social things that we're taught. We're taught, you know, things from our parents. And um, these things affect our money mindset deeply. Okay? And unless we really address them, um, they're going to hinder our acceptance of abundance into our life. Um, and so I'm actually uh, in the process of creating something really awesome, I think, um, and something that I've seen a real need with a lot of women that, especially women that I speak to. Um, and so we're creating this something called the Money Mindset Workshop, where we really kind of do like a self-financial therapy, you know, exercises that kind of hash out um, why we feel, what, what we're feeling about money, first of all, and why we're feeling these things. Um, to really expose some of these like sore points um, so that women can really, you know, embrace abundance and be like, yeah, I want to be rich and that's totally cool, <laughs> you know? Um, so, you know, I, I'm really super excited about that. And the other thing is that I've seen is that and I'm like a Capricorn. I'm very much about like doing and getting things done and, act, you know, at being actionable. What I've seen and I didn't expect when I first started my coaching business was that investing isn't just about making more money and having your, you know, investment portfolio grow. Although that's like the kind of, you know, advertised purpose. <laughs> um, the secondary benefit, and it's like, I think in a lot of ways, like even like more prof the profoundly um, impactful is that when you start investing it changes your relationship with money you start seeing it as a tool and you start seeing it money as something that you are deserving of okay and this happens through doing you know when you start doing something like anything you start exercising you're like hey i can do this you start you know learning new recipes in your kitchen you're like i was always afraid of cooking and now i can see that you know you know, now that I've gained a bit of confidence, I can totally do this. And so through the actual action of, you know, learning to invest and investing your money, it has like are such a beautiful uh, impact on women's money mindsets. And I'm just so, so happy when I see these breakthroughs in my students. Yes, Anjali, preach. Like this is what we need. <laughs> what you're reminding me of actually different tangent, but Mari Kondo's book, the, you know, life change magic of tidying. She talks about the same thing, how sort of once you get a hold of your stuff and where it is and what brings you joy about how all of her clients started seeing changes in other elements of their lives, just because you get that confidence. Um, you're, you're on with two Aries right now. So we're like high intensity, make it happen, fire symbols. So Grab the bull by the horns really... and ride it. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I know Joanna is. And honestly, I'm like, I'm always, I, 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 I'm, I follow Joanna. And like, even if we don't talk for, you know, months sometimes, like I watch what you're doing and I'm like, this girl is like, on fire like she gets to I am she here for me, I'm, I'm here for both of it and I think this leads perfectly into our sort of final segment which is what were all three of us what were our money wins so that could be a quick tip a purchase you feel great about or even a way you saved but not to or invested your money so yeah take it away Woo. great so um you know, a lot of us have seen our kind of retirement funds dwindle, um, and it's kind of scary. Uh, so what I suggest is, to women is get back in there, add money to your portfolio. That way, A, yeah, you are taking advantage of the market situation, um, but you're, or add money or rebalance your portfolio. So I have some great rebalancing tools, which um, I recommend. Um, it's just like basically a spreadsheet, but, um, you know, once you do that, you're like, yeah, fine. My, my retirement account might have taken a bit of a hit, but now I'm taking advantage of the situation. Even if it's like a couple of thousand dollars uh, or whatever it is, whatever you have, you're like, you feel like a winner when you do that, you know? Um, and 
it's really about, like you said, it's about mindset. So feeling like a winner is huge, you know, not feeling like a victim, like, when is my, you know, when are my investments going to recover? Like I did this for myself. I know for sure my portfolio is taking a hit. I personally don't look at my portfolio like ever, like very rarely. Like I don't, there's nothing I can do about, and you know, my, um, my stocks, you know, having taken a hit. So I don't look at them. Um, what I did do a few weeks ago uh, was I added money. Um, and uh, that made me feel good. Like, hey, I'm taking advantage of this difficult situation. I'm bettering myself. And honestly, this is like investing and taking care of your money is the best form of self-care. Like we talk a lot about oh, self-care right now. This is, yes. this for me is really, you know, is, is the most, is one of the most impactful mm. ways that, that you can do that. Beautiful. Joanna, what was your money win? Yeah. So, so to dovetail on that, so I got my tax refund because I did uh, file in time and signed up for a direct deposit. And it was the most substantial tax refund I've ever had because I guess I was really stuffing my RRSP this year. And a hundred percent of it is going back into the market. And I have a plan. I'm putting, uh, you know, like a thousand dollars at a time every week just to take advantage of up days and down days in the market. Um, and it just feels good to, you know, have had a plan that um, that I can put the t my tax refund to the best possible use. And I mean, it's kind of like, yeah, Canadian government, thank you for incentivizing me to save for my own retirement. Um, but right now, it just feels like the most sort of empowering thing to do with that money is not to, I don't know, buy a new purse or fancy shoes, but just put it towards my future self. Um, so that has been, I think the title of this fancy thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> the only clothes I'm interested in, and I saw this as a global thing is, is like loungewear and sweatpants are, are trending. <laughs> yes. Net yes. a porte sold out of like the Chloe $700 sweatpants. I'm just like, this oh. is ridiculous. But yeah, so not buying any clothes, just putting it back into the market and it feels amazing. And I think the title of this episode might be investing is self care. Mm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm, and the other perfect. thing, sorry, just, just, I know you said one win, but I'm going to cheat and give you another one. Um, no, it so can be wins. I know, for, <laughs> I know for me, um, I looked at my bank account the other day and I was like shocked at how little money I've been spending. Partly because I'm so busy mm. with work and like helping women with investing that I have no time to like do like any online shopping or anything. Um, but I've spent like, my cut my when when all stores are closed and you can't go anywhere it's like the best way to cut down i feel uh you know it's been imposed on us but look at how much money you're saving okay right now from this current situation if you're fortunate enough to be employed um you know you're still getting a paycheck um and you can take that money and instead of you know just leaving it there to kind of evaporate or be spent eventually be like oh look i normally spend um you know, uh, $2,000 a month on whatever, on living expenses and, you know, minus rent. And right now I'm spending like a third of that. So take that money and either put it in, you know, if you want to beef up your emergency fund right now is I'm not, I'm not, I don't usually, I'm not a big proponent of emergency funds, but right now, you know, for a lot of people, cash is king with kind of, you know, job insecurity and whatnot. So you might want to beef up on your um, emergency fund. Um, or you might want to, you know, use that to invest. Um, so like, you know, this is a kind of really interesting time where we're kind of, you know, if we play it right, we can save a lot of money. Yeah. Anjali, I, I think my money went kind of dovetails off that in that I did beef up my emergency account recently. Um, and that actually felt really good as well. I think if if stocks are our protein and bonds are that like basic vegetable or high interest account, then cash is is the fat and keto diet, et cetera, have told us that, well, you know, in the 80s and 90s, we we're very fat averse. Everything was low fat and ended up being high sugar. Uh, we want to keep some some healthy fats in the diet, too. Just to use its metaphor. We're so really go I think going with this metaphor. Girls, I love it. I'm, I like a metaphor. <laughs> I like a metaphor. And I love so it. For me, actually, the the money win for me was it like felt actually quite luxurious to be like I'm gonna have an even bigger emergency fund so that I never have to feel stressed. 
when these things happen. And I didn't, I didn't do that by pulling anything out of the market, but some money that perhaps I would put to other things I'm now putting right into like a set aside cash only account. Um, so I can feel really good knowing that I always have that and have a buffer uh, for myself and, and, and for others as needed. I think a lot of women are taking stock of like self-care for themselves, but also will I need to, to help someone out who might, might not have the resources I have right now. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm like, As I'm actually looking wins. right now. I'm, I'm that, that helping other people um, is, you know, first help yourself, obviously, but helping other people feels really good at a time that we can't, we feel, you know, that there's so much going on in the world and we're not, I, f I personally feel like I'm not doing it enough doing enough you know like there's like doctors out there who are like mm -hmm. risking their lives there's like grocery yes. delivery people that are you know like making sacrifices for us and so what i actually did was um i've been i've been looking at different kind of people in my life uh that maybe are going through a hard time financially and i'm thinking you know my business is doing really well right now and i can take advantage of that um, you know, extra financial security, and I could maybe hire them to do things for me. Like, um, there's, a, a, you know, a personal trainer at my gym um, that I really like, and she's, you know, out of work. And so I've always wanted to kind of get her to help me with some exercises. So uh, we're planning a little video session, uh, and I'm going to pay her for that, obviously. Um, and I'm looking at, you know, maybe some of my students even have a great skill set and are out of work. So, um, you know, why not use right now as a time to do things I was kind of like planning on anyways, or things that I was interested in either in learning or, uh, you know, services that I was planning on getting for my business, like personal or business. Um, you know, these people are eight, like, you know, they have more time right now. Um, they're going to be grateful. They're also going to, it's going to strengthen your relationship with them, you know, whether they're friends or, or, or whatever. Um, and I just think it's like a great way to sort of like give back without, you know, you know, I've been giving to charity as well, but it's a really organic, nice way to kind of give back without making people feel like, you know, they owe you because they're giving you a service, you know, um, or if product or whatever. Um, and so, you know, for me being financially secure, this is also what it's about. It's about exactly what Leslie said. It's about being able to help other people. Oh, yeah, that's true I'm prosperity. That that. Yeah, let's sign off with some big gratitude to our frontline workers and with love and dividends. With love and dividends. Thanks so much, Anjali. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. I really enjoyed this talk. Um, and uh, I have like high, high hopes for your podcast taking over the world. So congratulations on launching uh, during a pandemic. Uh, and yeah, uh, this was, this was lovely. Awesome. Thanks so much. Talk soon. Thank you so much for listening to the love and dividends podcast. And if you got value from this podcast, please share it with another woman or person who could benefit from the information shared. And please consider rating us and leaving us a review on iTunes. It really helps with new podcasts. If you have questions about finance or investing or have suggestions for future topics or guests, we'd love to hear from you. You can shoot us a DM on Instagram, just love and dividends, nothing else fancy. Or you can send me an email, joanna at loveanddividends.com. With love and dividends.